what makes it so good is that it, when you're trying to construct a society of some sort and, 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 and construct some sort of uh, livable experience, you know, that's when you're back to asking all the questions that everyone has just taken for granted for so long. That's, I mean, again, that's why I think philosophy is so neat is because even though we do, we're living in this, you know, society, ordered civilization, all that kind of stuff, we're, we're back to asking those questions about what makes all this possible, you know. So, for instance, like when we talk about ethics, you know, we're talking about, you know, what makes all this possible, like how, why we're living this way and how we'll live this way. And, and, and you know, even some of our assumptions, do they really make sense? Like, would these work, say, in the face of, you know, you know, a viral, you know, zombie apocalypse or whatever like if we if we took these principles that we're assuming right now with these work or should or, or would we even have any reason to um, continue to hold to these these kind of principles you know so I mean that's what makes it interesting is that the first that's why again the first two seasons are so good because they're wrestling all I mean they don't say that you know like they don't say like oh right now what we're examining is utilitarianism or, oh, right now what we're examining is a deontological ethic. But that's what they're doing. Right. Right. But that's exactly what they're doing. And, like, that's what's, you know, so crazy is that people are like, you know, oh, well, philosophy is just all this abstract stuff and nobody cares about it and philosophy is ridiculous and blah, blah, blah. Like, well, then why do you love those kind of shows? Because that's what it is. You just didn't know that, you know. You just didn't know that somebody was taking those concepts. In fact, I would even say that probably a great majority of the writers and authors and composers of those kind of things, they don't know that that's what they're asking, you know, because those things are just basic to humanity. It's just that philosophy, you've had guys who have said, oh, this is what, this is what that is. Like what you're doing right now, we're going to name that this, and then we're going to talk about that and label that and think about that and think critically about that and try to, bring out what's good about that or what's bad about it or why this won't work at all like that just is philosophy especially in regard to ethics and then even more so especially what we we're talking about earlier about uh, the grounding problem you know like, what grounds this you know like, what grounds our moral ob obligations and why we ought to act the way we do and all that sort of stuff and that's just what that's just what they're doing um in those series like the Walking Dead or Lost or whatever at the first at the onset, you know, the first couple seasons or so or whatever. That's what makes that good. Now, you know, I mean, I think too it shows you why now like they have to rely more on like uh the shock factor of like gore and all that kind of stuff because the plot is just I mean, there's still a plot there, obviously, but there's like those big questions that keep you intrigued just by themselves. They're just not there. As prominently and they're there in some sense but they're just not there as prominently as they were you know because again just to keep the the series going you kind of had to move past all that you know you couldn't have them you know seven years later still trying to figure out like all right do we need to <laughs> yes possible well remember though they had when they first launched that you know they had to season you know not even knowing if they'd get another contract you know. Yeah, I don't even know. But but two, they didn't know if anybody would watch it. You know, so you had to do the first seat. Like the first season was like six episodes or something. You know, five or five, somewhere between like five and seven episodes. Because you just don't know if well if we'll get a contract or even renew this show. You know, and so now a season's like a billion episodes or whatever. So all right, where is everybody? I'm sick of this. I'm sick of that. I'm sick of that. All right, so what we're going to do is, as if, if you already missed it, we've already started talking about ethics and how, um, how so what, what's so interesting is that all of these shows that we're enraptured with or whatever, especially in the, at the onset of these shows that show these dystopian futures, you know, future apocalyptic type scenarios that they're, they're wrestling with, you know, major philosophical questions and ethical issues. For instance, the movie The Road, have you seen that? I mean, that's the same thing. All goes to hell and everybody's like, you know, all right, how do we behave now? 
you know, like, what are we supposed to do? Like, how do we live? And so you've got these groups that are bad guys. Um, what we would traditionally see is bad guys. But then in light of the context of the movie or whatever, you're like, but what makes them bad guys? Right? Right? You know, well, if you're thinking, that's what you, if, if you're thinking person, that's what you think about is like, all right, these are the bad guys. You know, clearly these are the bad guys. You know, like in that movie, The Road, it's like the father and the son, you know, and the mom, you know, takes on this atheistic existential feel of like, why even bother living here? Like, why, why live like this? You know, which again is just kind of the atheistic existential stuff of Jean Paul Sartre and all those guys. Well, you just got to choose. Well, so she decides to, and I don't want to do a movie spoiler or anything. So if you're, want to see that then just you know plug your ears for a second but so she essentially just decides to off herself you know and uh so the dad is just left with his, his little boy because the mom is like look like it's just a matter of time until this group of you know basically you know just wild heathen you know pagan whatever's overtake us i mean it's just every man for himself kind of thing you know and she's like personally i just don't want to watch our son uh, you know, be raped and then killed, and then you just tortured and killed, and take your jacket and whatever basic little necessities that you have, and just like, why do I want to live this way, right? So, so she decides to to kill herself or whatever, and so the dad just doesn't want to do that. He just can't bring himself to do that. You know, he wants to try to live for some reason or whatever. Well, then the bad guys come along. You know, they find the little boy and the and the dad, and so again, according to tra traditional, in the traditional sense, we see that those guys are the bad guys, right? But then, you know, if you're a thinking person, you start to ask, well, what makes them bad guys? Like, there's no law, there's no government, you know. And if we're back to survival of the fittest, you know, do any of these ethical theories that we'll talk about? Like, do any of these work in that sense? So imagine you've got bad guys coming up to do these atrocious, you know, things or whatever. I think, oh, well, let's put in, let's put into practice our utilitarianism, you know, or let's study, let's, let's think about Kant's deontological ethic or, hey, look, we're all just moral relativists anyway, you know, something like that. And so you start asking those kind of questions. Um, does anybody have any just anything you want to jump off with or begin with before we start to kind of look at those ethical systems, just like we did in the God arguments, how we looked kind of at a thousand foot overview first, just to kind of give us a, a broad, you know, understanding in some sense of what we're going to look at before we get into the, each of the specifics of those. You might have anything you want to say first. Any questions? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> what does this mean to you? Anything? You missed a lot of good stuff, man. What I missed? We were just talking about how, like, all these movies and TV shows that are popular now really revolve around what we're about to talk about. About ethics and like how you ought to behave and why should you behave that way and what grounds real behavior no we're talking about like the walking dead and like that movie the road and stuff like that if everything is wiped out what makes those movies interesting is everybody's basically in a moral dilemma like how are we supposed to, how are we supposed to act you know and then what well that that's that's the thing is the bad guys are always those guys right the bad guys are the ones going around doing whatever they, whatever they want to do taking advantage of the, the weak and all those kind of things right and then the question is when everybody sees them as bad guys the question is well wait a minute what makes that bad why is that bad yeah right I mean if we're if it's if it's just if it's just we're animals again You've just assumed that we were different because of civilization and society and all these things, but that's all gone now. So what if we're just survival of the fittest, you know? So 
essentially what that's what we were saying is just all these ethical theories are at play right here right just utilitarianism dental law all these sorts of things so anyway we were saying what does anybody want to say anything before we jump into all of that no what is that is it does it well, that's what we're saying all of these like dystopian future kind of things all revolve around this stuff you know or even like that movie quiz show do y'all remember that movie quiz show who's seen that it's out on netflix right now it's really good it's called quiz show and it's about like all the handle and rigging of those quiz shows like in the 50s and 60s that were so super popular and and how basically about the, the investigation and how it all came out they were all rigged and it's really interesting but one of the spots in that a part in that movie is he's like what do i do like and he tries to in the movie he says what would kant do right now meaning kant and we'll talk about kant's deontological ethic meaning like how should i act in this particular circumstance so hey y'all be quiet punks we jump in before we talk about again from a thousand foot overview Come on, somebody say something good. I don't want to just already get into that. <laughs> Ethics. Is there a particular ethic you think you as ascribe to? I mean, everybody lives every day, right, making moral choices, right? I mean, that's, I mean, that's, think about any TV show you like. They all revolve around morality, all of them. Every action movie, every rom-com, every movie you watch, even horror movies, all revolve around some sort of moral dilemma. All of them. I like how, okay, so like, if you notice, like, all of the movies, the, the, like, the good guy and the movie, the movies, is always, uh, it's like the, does the right thing by everybody. Right, or think about. I like how they're, how they're like, shifting that, so now, like, but but and they but here's the thing and they can't eat, but they still can't get around that yeah right like have you ever seen that have you seen that new movie uh blood father with mel gibson pretty good it's not bad well so he's supposed to be basically like a bad guy or you know but think about the plot of the movie he's trying to do what what everybody recognizes is what the right thing he's trying to rescue his daughter from these bad guys <laughs> again like you just can't get away from these moral what about like, uh, for instance so hang on okay. i got well i didn't i haven't seen that one so i don't even want to i can't say yet but i would guarantee again like imagine that movie blood father like he's, he's trying to rescue his girl from these t imagine if he had no moral obligation to do that whatsoever how interesting would that movie be what if you honestly what if you honestly didn't have this assumed this presumed this presupposed moral view you would literally be like what's it matter if he saves his daughter i don't care like but you just can't live that way everything that makes all this stuff interesting is this moral conundrum that ties up all this stuff i mean even freaking superman movies right you want him to save so and so because that would be what right thing to do like you feel this obligation like man he ought to do this but what if you'd really what if that was completely gone what if you didn't think like that what if you're just like who cares right or would you know remember not not necessarily remember they just don't feel right but they may not but that doesn't mean they don't know right well superman kind of deals with that in general because he's like i'm an alien I'm kind of a superior race of being. I don't really have to say, like, he, in the comics, he fights with that a lot. And I know they're playing that up in the movies now. Well, yeah, like, when the first came back out, like, what was the, like, when I was a little boy, General Zod or whoever, but those guys, the new ones, what was one of their big things against Superman? And then in the newer one. Right, and what was their whole point, and what, what, what were they saying? Not morally wrong. What were they saying? What was their main thing in that? They're like, we've evolved. What? We've evolved past what? Past morality. 
They're like, you haven't evolved. You still have this semblance of morality that you haven't evolved past. We've evolved past morality. We don't have any moral obligations. He said, this is your weakness, is that you still see things through this human lens that you ought to behave a certain way. We've evolved past that. We don't have to behave a certain way. Right? And so, again, this is what, that, this is what makes the whole movie interesting is what? It's moral dilemma and ethical questions like we just can't get away from those things which is hilarious i think in our culture because that's what we constantly say we're getting away from right but you can't get away from them it always boomerangs back around for instance think about this let's talk about a let's just to pick on a uh, cultural hot button topic right now because this is you know everybody has a stake in the game here so to speak so um so when someone says something like uh, again, let's do a big one, cultural hot button, abortion. So if someone says something like, uh, you can't impose your moral view on other people because, you know, that would be, you know, well, I don't want to say yet, but blah, 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 blah. So every woman has a right to have a, an abortion or whatever. All right. So basically they're saying like, look, morality is something that's subjective to each individual. So you can't say that women can't have an abortion. Again, whatever side of the aisle you're on there, this is interesting because, every again, everybody has a stake in it. So what's the odd thing about that if that if that's the justification or rationalization? What's the odd thing about saying that? How do you replace the law? I mean, we have law based on morality. And you can't commit murder or you can't kill somebody. But sure, but, how, but in direct response to that or in direct regard to that particular position, what's the odd thing about that? That one particular position. So they're saying, look, they're saying this. They're saying you can't enforce your moral view or your morals, say, in regard to this particular position, this hot button cultural topic, abortion, because everyone is subject to their own beliefs about morality. What's the problem with that if that's the justification of the reasoning process behind it? Because that's a moral position on that topic, right? It's saying that, look, you can't say what everybody has to do, so therefore, everybody has a right to do this. Why does that make sense? Right? If everyone, if you can't say anything in regards to that specific topic in regards to moral, the moral worth or, or, or moral decision in regards to that, well, then how can you say that everyone has a right to do that particular thing right you can't not and then this is kind of what you were getting at a second ago is that you can't not legislate morality why right I mean that's all you legislate that's all you legislate is morality right I mean think about it I mean, we make laws, literally, you can't go over 55 miles an hour on the highway or whatever. Well, why? Because it must be wrong to drive recklessly on the highway, right, and endanger people's lives or whatever. You can't not legislate morality. That's all you legislate, you know? I mean, again, think of, think, why can't you cheat on tests in school? Because it must be wrong to cheat on tests, right? Not just intellectually wrong, but morally wrong, right? Some sort of in some sort of moral sense. In fact, think about this: like, if you were going to be not "quote unquote" politically correct, if you were not politically correct, people want to say that it's wrong to what? Right. Yet you can't. Yet you can't impose your moral view on other people, right? Yet you can't impose your moral view on other people well what does it mean then if you're supposed to all be tolerant right that's just a moral view but think about this let's think about the law of non-contradiction what if i were to say joshua you cannot impose your moral view on other people i'm doing it right now how that's my moral view you could tell me what shut up uh because you're doing it right now Right. <laughs> Law of non-contradiction. You can't impose your moral view on other people. Why are you doing it? You're doing it right now. 
if you think that other people don't have any moral obligations at all in the sense of they can't or they shouldn't impose their moral view, then you ought to keep your mouth shut because that's what you're doing. So the question is not really can we impose or can we avoid imposing our moral views? The question is just whose morality are we, are, are we going to impose, right? Which, which, which view are, are we going to impose? Because they're all being imposed, right? So again, hot button topic. The pro-life people want to impose their moral view that you ought not have abortions, right? Pro-choice people are trying to impose their moral view. What? That abortion should are a good thing that should be available to everyone, right? That's a moral position. They're both trying to impose a moral view. Both of them. Right? Pro-life people think it must be wrong to have an abortion. The abortion people, the pro-choice people, think it must be morally right to allow people to have abortions. They're both moral views, right? I mean, you just you can't get around it. So the question is, well, which which view are you going to impose? You can't get around imposing one. You're going to. They're both. They're both involved uh, or revolve around uh, moral experience or moral obligations and ethical theories, all that kind of thing. So. With that said, we can look at our top-down approach. Man, where's my red marker? It's the best one. Man. I bet one of my, my kids are real bad about I'll leave this bag sitting by the door, and they'll get these markers as if they're just like, you know, markers. And they'll go like color their stuff with it, you know, and then they'll just disappear, and I don't know where they are. I don't know. All right, so... Have, what do you guys think are different ethical theories? Have you heard of any different ethical theories? You've tried to apply them, I guarantee you. You just didn't know they had names. So what do you think is what do you think is one of the names of an ethical theory? In fact, what in your book, remember the reading stuff you're supposed to do, they go ahead and outline a few of them. What are they? Or at least one of them. What's the one you've heard of? Please don't shoot me. Oh, that would be something like a rule under one particular theory, right? So what is what what is a what's an example of an ethical theory? I've already said one about three different times in here. By name. This is one, these are the ones we're gonna talk about. We may talk about a few more, but these are the ones we're guaranteed we're gonna talk about. So utilitarianism. And for our purposes here, we're going to combine this with consequentialism. All right, what's another one? Deontology. Deontology. Yeah, we're going to specifically talk about Kant's version. Emmanuel Kant. Come on, guys, somebody does this every semester. <laughs> All right, what's another one? Virtue. Virtue ethics, right? And we'll probably combine this with something like natural law theory. <laughs> natural law theory. What's the other big one? What is the, this isn't technically an ethical theory, but we're going to talk about it under, under the genre of ethical theories because you'll see how it is distinct, but not necessarily different. And that is, it, this is the big one on, on uh, college campuses usually. What do you think it is? And in, cult, and in culture. Moral what? Relativism. So these are the ones that we'll for sure talk about, and we'll hopefully we'll be able to bang out a few more in regards to that. But these are the these are the main uh, ethical theories that we'll deal with. Um, oh, and this one probably too. We'll probably go with this one. Divine command theory.
which is a, a version of this theory right here. It would fall under something like a deontological type ethic. Now, you've got, let's go ahead and talk about this first. You've got a, you've got a deontological type ethic. Well, usually all of these are going to fit into a category that's going to be something like this, deontological, which means basically the, the, you look at the principle. That specific principle or that particular rule always goes. And then you have to figure out how you work that. Well, then the other is going to be some. The others are going to fall into this other kind of category. So you're going to have, have this kind of the first one, and the others are going to be something like this kind of category, a teleological type category. And what do you think we mean by that? Remember when we're talking about the existence or the arguments for God's existence and non-existence? What did teleological have to do with? It's going to be similar to that. Uh, the end goal, right? Remember, if the teleological argument for God's existence has to do with the end or final causes, right? Well, then a teleological ethic is going to have something to do in that regards too. It's going—I mean, again, it's different. It's more analogous than it is univocal in its meaning there, but it's going to be something like that too. So, utilitarianism. Do you think it's going to be a deontological type ethic or a teleological type ethic? Consequentialism, utilitarianism. What do you think that that's going to have to do with? Yeah. Right. It's going to have, it's going to be something about back that way, right? Is it going to be right here, or is it going to be well, what happens over here, right? So utilitarianism, consequentialism. It's going to be well, what happens not necessarily right here at the moment, but way down here. So that's going to fall into something like that, right? Deontological, that's pretty self-explanatory. Is it going to fall into a deontological type ethic or a teleological type ethic? All right, it's going to fall into this first, a deontological type ethic, which makes perfect sense, right? Now, deontological is all about that particular right or wrong, right, right there. It's not necessarily concerned about what? The consequences, right? In fact, you could kind of sum up a lot of deontological ethical theories with that phrase, you do the right thing to hell the consequences, right? As if that, now this one would be completely reversed. Completely reversed. Now, virtue type ethics, or, and again, natural law theory isn't necessarily an ethical theory per se. This is just something about the, 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 the standard or whatever by which you're supposed to behave or things are supposed to be or whatever. But virtue ethics ties in with this because a lot of times they would virtue ethics the way you know what's right or wrong is here and then how you put it into practice is something like this. So anyway, what, what kind of ethic do you think this would fall under virtue ethics and stuff? Deontological or teleological? Huh? The, the bird one. No, it's going to fall into teleological because virtue ethics and natural law theory is, is trying to be molded to some particular thing, right? Now, it's not necessarily going to be against this, but technically speaking, it's teleological because it's the end goal. So, as the ancients would say, the goal of life is to live the good life, right? Now, that's been completely marred in the American culture. The good life now means what? Something like you see on a, you know, music television type channel. You know, the good life is riding around on a friggin' boat, you know, drinking martinis all day long and women in bathing suits or whatever. The good life for them was that you were you, you you lived the good, meaning the good life, like you were a virtuous person, even if that meant that you never had anything to do with uh, what we would say is the good life now. If you had no money, no fame, no pleasure, no nothing, that you were a good person, you lived the good life. And that was supposed to be the goal of everyone was supposed to be the good life by virtue of what it meant to be what? A human being, right? So moral relativism, where do you think this falls in these two? This is actually a trick question. <laughs> Neither. Neither. Didn't, it says these don't even exist, right? No such thing. No such thing. All right, divine command theory, where do you think that would fit? Teleological or, or deontological type ethic? 
<coughs> Where do you think that would fall? It's going to fall here. It's going to be a deontological type ethic, right? Now, again, looking at all these, kind of to highlight, you're going to have roughly these kind of types of theories. This and this, deontological and teleological, all of these are going to roughly going to fall into one kind of one of these kind of uh, categories here. So, roughly speaking, what are our ethical theories that we'll probably look the most at? We've got them right here. What are they? This is just literally as easy as reading the board. What are they? Huh? All of them. Yeah, you're <laughs> right. Utilitarianism, deontology, specifically Kant's version, and then probably uh, divine command theory too, because that's popular. Virtue ethics and or slash natural law theory, which, which coincides with that. Moral relativism and divine command theory. And also under moral relativism, I'll we'll probably look at one your book talks about, which is ethical egoism. <laughs> which is but not necessarily really different from moral relativism. I think because personally, this is just me, but personally I think that ethical e egoism is just moral relativism in a tuxedo. I mean, I really think that. I mean, when you read your book, you're supposed to have already read it. So if you hadn't read that, there's little ethical theories there. But see if you come, see if you see if you come to that same conclusion when you look at ethical egoism. See if you think that that's also moral relativism dressed up kind of in a tuxedo. Um, which do you think? Which which do you think will probably be the one that I would want to most talk about? The most fun to talk about, I think. <laughs> why? Why do you think that one? <laughs> Man, that's a fantastic argument. Let's put that in the form of syllogism. Syllogism, <laughs> premise one, premise two, because <laughs> three, <laughs> therefore. <laughs> All right. So, any other guesses? Which one do you think I think is the most fun to talk about? Was that not right? Well, maybe. What are you going to say, Joshua? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, we are down to like, what, three people in the class now, so. Yeah, uh, moral, really, really. <laughs> yeah I like to talk about this, really. Honestly, I'm, well, I'm kind of being disingenuous. Like, I really like to talk about all of them. I think they're real fun. But I really like to talk about this one just because this is so prevalent right now, right? Especially on college campuses, right? Like, little kids aren't moral relativists, are they? Why not? So, right, a lot of times it does, doesn't it? Old people usually aren't moral relativists. <laughs> right? That moral relativism is so popular. <laughs> I think it's the opposite. I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. Um, do you want to expand on that? Uh, well, like, I won't lie. Like, I'm very middle ground person on a lot of issues. But that's because it's not because I don't take a stance. It's because I take a stance either one way or another. Because I don't fall on one political end of the spectrum entirely. I'm in the middle. But a lot of that bullshit is I'm not going to take a stand on anything. I want to stay in the middle. I want to say that nobody's wrong so that everybody likes it. Right, I think a lot. Of, I think that is a lot of the problem with that. Is that it's really not courageous in any sense. I think it's kind of. It's not saying we really believe in much. It's saying that oh no, no, don't tell somebody that they're wrong. Right now, are there arguments though for this? Yeah. Yeah, they're just really bad. Ones. Well, what do you think one of the arguments might be for that? What I think I, I think I kind of briefly mentioned something that we talked about earlier in this course. Culture. All right. By the observation of what? People living in the desert. Well, you said it. The observation of what? That first word. Culture. Of cultures, right? So a lot of times, who make who makes these types of arguments? It surprisingly, it's not going to be necessarily a 
lot of your philosophers, theists or atheistic. That's irrelevant. It's not going to be a lot of your philosophers. It's going to be your who? To an extent. Or sociologists, anthropologists, right? What do those, what do those people do? Well, <laughs> I'm not going to say that. But what do they do? What does anthropology do? What does sociology do? Right, it's just look at cultures, right? Observe cultures, draw things from cultures, right? So they're going to try to argue, make arguments based on that. Or they're going to look at descriptive, you know, like, all right, ethical, all right, I should have said this earlier. Prescriptive ethics versus descriptive. And this also, too, you can say normative. But so that you can remember it easier, you can say prescriptive versus descriptive. What do you think descriptive ethics are? What do you think descriptive ethics are? That's exactly right. You're just describing what? Behaviors, right? You're watching a particular culture, whatever it may be, and you're describing the way people act, right? What do you think prescriptive ethics are? By the way, all of these, except for this one, all of these are prescriptive ethics, ethical theories. Right. It's exactly right. It's prescribing. Like, so when you go to the doctor and you get a prescription, what are you supposed to do? He's telling you that you're supposed to take this thing, right? It's prescribed to you. So that's the same analogously with prescriptive ethics. This is the way you, this ethical theory, if it works, is going to tell you what? How, you're all, how you ought to what? Right, behave and so on and so forth. If this works, it's going to tell you how you ought to act or behave, right? If this works, it's going to tell you how you ought to behave or act. If this works, it's going to tell you how you ought to behave or act, right? This is what? Which one? How you are. Descriptive, right? Right? Except for this, this are over here. The floor comes. To, this would act. This ethical egoism. This would try to be this one right here. But I'm just lumping it with this because I think it really, at the end of the day, is just this. Because I, again, why I think this ethical egoism is just this. Yeah. And that's about how good I think the tuxedo looks too. Exactly. <laughs> it didn't even look good. <laughs> it didn't even look good. So anyway, when she gets go ahead. Joshua, don't you wish you had these skills? <laughs> this. This is that grandma flab, that, like, that mom off lab. Who's seen mom off lab? <laughs> Get in there and it holds it up. That's like when you watch those YouTube videos of like somebody slow-mo and like punching somebody in the face. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like... <laughs> You need to watch those. Those are good. Yeah. You said that letting it moving your hand from your mouth. Good always gonna know it too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so prescriptive, descriptive, this is how you ought to behave. See look, this right here, this guy's easily fills up your reflection paper. Like you almost you just you just copy this off the board and your reflection paper is essentially done. Turn in your flipping reflection paper. That's how you want to do this real quick. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, you write this. Essentially, you write this, and you write two thoughts about each one of these or whatever, or just whatever else we talked about today, and your reflection paper is done. Like. Anyway, script is all, this is just describing actions. How? How? All 
pound. So you're just describing. And again, descriptive or prescriptive? Descriptive or prescriptive? Descriptive or prescriptive? Descriptive. Technically? Right, technically prescriptive, right? So, with that said, we have tons of time left, but I don't really don't want to get into our first ethical theory today. I'm guessing what ethical egoism then is like more morals are relative, but here's why mine are better in a way. Well, ethical egoism, and again, I don't want to get too deep into it today because I want to give literally, I want to have a, a full class for each one of these so we can, you know, really look at the positives and the negatives about them. If there are positives and, and, if, and if there are negatives. But ethical egoism, roughly, and I'm, I'm very much oversimplifying here. And again, you can check in your book, you know, if you want to get the details of it, if you don't want to wait till we talk about it. But oversimplified is it's basically you do what is the best benefit to you. And that's how everyone ought to behave. Because if everyone does behave that way, if everyone, quote unquote, looks out for themselves or does what is the best for them, then that in some way, and I'm going to be very uncharitable here, very uncharitable, but that some way magically works out for the best of society too. If, if you do what's best for you, right, then that somehow also works out for the, again, I, that's why I'm being uncharitable and say magically, because obviously I'm sitting here going, yeah, I'm saying, it sounds like asshole theory. Right. And you, yeah, so you would just, but he said everybody would have to be super counterproductive. Everybody just agreed to. Uh, yeah. Well, again. But it works out magically. Right. But magically, it's going to work out in the wash. It all comes out in the wash. But again, am I oversimplifying? Absolutely. So if you don't want to wait till we kind of talk about that, you yeah, can look at it. Best for me. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, I mean, there you go. I mean, that's one way to apply it. So. Sorry, I'm going to take this house now. <laughs> so let's look at, so so let's get back to this question right here remember we're looking at all this from the overview what does you remember when we talked about the meta meta ethical uh, uh, topic of grounding right because this is something your book doesn't want again I just don't get why it doesn't want to go into grounding it just wants to assume all right look we're, not, we're just going to completely ignore the meta-ethical problems and just look at the, the theories themselves. But if utilitarianism works, what is it supposed to do for you? Well, when I say you, I mean in general. What is it supposed to do writ large? It's supposed to really give you what? True, right, and wrong, right? So when we talk about this utilitarianism, I want always to, I want, on any of these, I want you to keep in your mind the meta ethical issues. Remember, what is that? For our purposes here, what is that? What is that meta ethical issue? What grounds this, right? What grounds this metaphysically, or is it just arbitrary again? Right. So, but if utilitarian works, it's supposed to help, in some sense, ground true rights and wrongs. Right. Meaning that it's not just what you make up, or it's not just you know whatever your arbitrary fiat is. It's supposed to ground it in some way. Right. That it really is right, or it really is wrong, objectively speaking. Right. The ontology, same thing. What's it? What if it works? What is it trying to do? It's not just showing you, giving you a practical way and to figure out what's right or wrong. Because all of these are supposed to give you pra a practical way to make, the de make your decisions, right? Your ethical decisions. You apply the principle of this, and we'll talk about that. And it will give you what? What you're supposed to do. So it's, it's supposed to be practical, but it's also supposed to what? At least in some sense, it's supposed to what? Ground real true rights and wrongs right moral duties obligations values all those sorts of things you're supposed to ground that right now if that works it's going to try to do that now again when we get out get down into these i want you to pay attention to and think about 
the axioms or the fundamentals that, the, that, these, that these ethical theories are built on, ask yourself the question, does this ground true rights and true wrongs? Because again, part of when we talked about the moral argument for God's existence, one of the defeaters or the objections to that argument was that what? We don't need what? Any sort of God to give us what? Not morals, maybe, but what? Objective what? Right. right. Objective right and wrong. Objective ethics. So, for instance, somebody might say, well, look, because why? We have utilitarianism. We don't need God to ground real rights and wrongs. We have this, right? Or we don't need God to ground true objective rights and wrongs because we have what? Kant, who gave us this ver his specific version of deontology. And we'll see how he tries to ground that. Now this right here, virtue ethics, natural law. This one's difficult because it's going to grind. It's going to try to again, just like all these, it's going to try to ground that in some sense, not just show you what you ought to do in some situation or whatever, but it's going to try to ground this. But this this virtue ethics and natural law theory, though technically speaking, are non-theistic. Technically speaking, are still are still going to be wrapped up somehow in some sort of theism, right? Well, you don't know that necessarily yet, but you'll see how that's some still tied in there somehow. Even though technically speaking, you could still be an atheist and hold to virtue, ethics, or natural law theory. Um, and we'll get into the specifics of that later. Now this one, what's it do with the grounding problem? The meta-ethical problem? It doesn't exist. Right, there's just not one, right? There's not one. All right, now, I think this one is probably the most obvious. How do you think this one's going to ground the meta-ethical problem? Right, or some sort of theism, right? So it's going to ground it in God somehow, right? Now, this one also will try to give you what? How you're supposed to behave, right? But then it's also what? I'm going to try to solve this, right? Because why? Because they've all got to answer this, right? Your book says you don't have to worry about it, but if this works, well, it's going to at least try to give me real rights and wrongs, right? Objective rights, objective wrongs. If this works, it's going to give me or try to give me real right. Aside from just showing me how I should behave in some in some circumstance, it's also going to what that I ought to behave that way, right? That it's what that I ought to do this, right? Not just that it's a good idea, or maybe you should consider this, but that I ought to, be, if this works, I ought to do what this says, right? Well, when we talk about alts, we're talking about this too, right? That it's really right or really wrong, regardless of what anybody, what, thinks or is brainwashed or goes against or whatever. Same thing here. This is just out to lunch. This too, same thing, right? That I ought to do a certain thing in a certain situation or be a certain way, right? That I have these real obligations, right? Do any of you have any thoughts so far? We might get out of here a little early because, again, I don't want to go into the specifics of each one of these and tell you that they each have their own kind of day, their own day in court. Any thoughts? <laughs> Good. It's my objective. Let me just go ahead and reveal my bias here. It's one of my objectives when we talk about ethical theories. To laugh at that one. It's for all of you to leave this room laughing at how ridiculous that is. And when you see it on Facebook or social media or whatever, being like, <laughs> because when people try to sound like Piper said, you know, one of my favorite terms, pseudo intellectual, and you start hearing this kind of stuff, I want you to be able to see it and be like. <laughs> And again, regardless of whatever aisle, side of the aisle you stand on, whether you're atheist, theist, you know, well, freaking Uzbekistan, whatever. What's that? So why do that one doesn't put you in Right, not necessarily right. So what I want you guys to be able, and again, that's my bias. So if right now you're already convinced of this, like you already know, crap, my professor's against that. All right. So you, if you want to hold on to that, you better do your extra homework. And then you won't get in trouble, obviously, if you believe in that. I mean, turn in your reflection paper, you still get 100. But I'm just saying, 
to reveal my bias, I want everybody leaving here thinking this is absolutely ridiculous. And hopefully, I don't think it'll be that difficult. I think when we just go through the arguments for and against it, I think you'll just be able to see that, I think. You may not, you may say, well, wait a minute, those arguments are really weak, I still think this is correct. You know, that's up to you, but hopefully, if we do our job well, I think that you'll see that this is pretty ridiculous. Um, anything else? Let's talk about something good for 10 minutes and I'll let you go early. Are we going to talk about the, the trolley? Right, I mean, yeah, I, I was using, I pulled that out on my wife this weekend. We were talking about a specific situation. I said, all right, let's look at the trolley. Okay, honey, what you Right, so each one of these, you would answer that differently, right? So what is that What is that thought experiment about the trolley? So you have a, so you have the tracks of the trolley, and the trolley doesn't have anyone on it, and, and they can't be stopped. And so it's going, you have four people tied up the tracks. But you notice that right before the four people, there's a lever that, that veers it off of that track onto another track, but it's one person tied on the track. So you do. So either you pull the lever and get one person to save the four, or you don't do anything but it run over the four people. Right. Now, the odd thing here, and sometimes you may have heard this like with the boat, like the, the people in the lifeboat thing. Have you heard that one? All right, you've got it, and this is going to be similar to that. You've, you've got a doctor in a lifeboat. You've got a handicapped child in a lifeboat. You've got a, an elderly lady in a lifeboat. And then you've got some just regular Joe Blow in the lifeboat. The problem is that two of you have to go. So who gets thrown off the side of the lifeboat? Now, the funny thing is, I just don't think it follows at all, is a lot of times people will offer that up to prove, because they'll let everybody talk about it, like the class talk about it or whatever. And then, based off different reasons, people come up with what? Different answers, right? And then so, a lot of instructors have tried to say that that proved, again, not necessarily many philosophy instructors, but a lot of instructors in other classes probably what English class or whatever, offer that kind of stuff to show you what? Anthropo some anthropology class, what? See, morals are just completely relative because everybody disagrees on what they ought to do. Again, we've talked about this a hundred times. Does that follow? Again, put your candy jar right here with your bubble gum pieces in it. Nobody knows the right answer. Does it logically follow that they're what? Joe Blow or whatever. Yeah, two of you have to go. I mean, you can you can do it however. What? They don't have much to look for. Right, but see, right. So the point is, like, you're gonna say that. Right. So the point is, you're gonna say that. Piper might say something. She might say something else. And then so. A lot of the anthropologists or sociologists, and I'm being mean to them here. I don't necessarily need to be that way. But if they don't have any sort of philosophical background or training at all, they're going to say, see, this just proves morals are relative. Because all of you gave the, all these completely different answers. There's not a, you don't know the right thing to do. You don't know the wrong thing to do. See, there's just not one. But again, does that logically follow? It's all wrong. No. Just because we all can't agree on an answer. Right. It just doesn't mean there's, right, exactly. Again. Right, or some difficult algebra equation, right? Or let's say that you put in an easy ethical scenario, right? You've got three kids or three people on the lifeboat, same scenario or however many people we said a minute ago, same exact people, and you've got a crate, a 50-pound crate of bananas. Well, you have to drop the lifeboat by 50 pounds or everybody's going to die. What do you do? You throw off the 50 pound crate of bananas, right? Yeah. Right, but still, it's pretty easy to say, well, all right, we, at least first we throw off the crate of bananas, right? So, anyway, a lot of times they'll take, again, those something that may be a difficult eth ethical situation show that there's that people are really having a hard time coming to the to coming to some sort of 
answer that agrees with one another and then say that there's not an answer. That's just like, I think, pulling up a difficult algebraic equation as opposed to just two plus two, pulling up the most difficult algebraic equation and saying, look, people are having a difficult time coming to this, there just must not be an answer. It just doesn't follow, right? Just like it doesn't follow or just, or, or to flip that rather, if you say one plus one is two, why didn't you just give an example like that? They all agreed. Well, that's too easy. Okay. But just by throwing up a hard one doesn't mean that there's not an answer. It just means you've just thrown up the hard case where people are ha really having a difficult time, right? So, what were you going to say? All right. Or that maybe, or you should say, maybe you should take an intro to philosophy class <laughs> before you get on a freaking lifeboat. Before you get on a lifeboat, take an intro to philosophy class. Like, couldn't you argue against the This is how I would argue that. When I would say, hey, Oh, so you're still bound. You're hey, you're bound to throw somebody off the flipping line. Well, I'm saying this. I would read this whole life, keep the bananas, and throw the whole person off as a sacrifice to help everybody else survive. And the reason that you would do that—a sacrifice to who or what? You? <laughs> so, it's, so it's the same. It's like the same concept of, of like the pack of wolves, right? When they're well, I mean, if people are you know packs. Of the the elderly or the oldest ones are the first to run that way if they're attacked they're taken out first and allow the no no yeah yeah and they set the pace for how how fast everybody else walk but anyway it's, it's, they're in the front to be like sacrificed to the better of the whole so i'm gonna say like the whole of the well no there's no better of the whole that's just again like remember if they're just animals that's just the way they walk that's just yeah. Just what con what seems to be conducive for survival of wolves. It's not better or worse. Isn't that more of every one of those other wolves looking out for number one? Like, really right. I mean, it's just survival. Right. It's just survival of the fittest. Right. So what if somehow some for some weird reason just that's just survival of the that's just what happens to be the the best adaptation. Right. Again, that's like saying like you have a moral obligation. That's like saying you have a moral obligation to develop a tan, right? You don't have any moral obligation. Would it be wrong to convince them to, to like, <laughs> off themselves? All these wolves, you should just throw yourself off the cliff at Grace. Yeah, <laughs> you have a moral obligation. You got to kill yourself. To save this entire world. Do good and save the world. Do good and save the world. Clearly, your decisions didn't work out well for you. So, out of here after 80 years in this world. So, I mean, the odds of her dying during the like surviving the whole you are thing. you are really bent on throwing this old lady out of the fire. You can ask, you can ask who doesn't like bananas and whoever raises their hand can start off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, who's allergic to bananas? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just feed them a banana. There we go. What's the yeah. Well, what sucks is they're like, you know, we could have made a whole other life raft out of that banana curry. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. So again, one of these things too, are we gonna what, what I want you to look at in the background is that how are they gonna solve or do they even believe in ethical dilemmas? What do you think I mean when I say moral like dilemmas? Huh? Like no, let's say that you have one standing thing, because one of the some of them may not even allow for it. They may say they don't even exist. But there's a, not a right choice in between. Well, or which is the right choice? You've got two what seem to be moral uh, yeah. rules according to this whichever theory that should be followed, and then what do you do when they come into conflict with one another? Yeah, old lady, this guy's getting rid of. See, this is why you don't need to be on the board of biomedical issues in regards to euthanasia and all that kind of stuff because we know where you're going. That's not my standpoint. Eighty years old. No. <laughs> Peace out. Literally has a sign no, just kill all the like, old people and like. Yeah, no. people in, like the states or everyone survival. Mm. Well, see, that's the thing. Like, let's suppose that Madison, you know, Mad Madison, French Mad Madison over here. Let's say she argues that you throw out the handicapped child. She probably. Yeah, yeah, you probably would argue that, wouldn't you? You, you radical. What is he contributing? Not even to say. <laughs> What is he talking about? I don't even know what he's saying. <laughs> 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 he's the doctor.
It's like, well, how are you going to help me in this rap? Dude, what have you contributed to science? <laughs> <laughs> and you're just a jerk. You think you're better than we are because you're a doctor. You're a doctor. <laughs> so you should just stop. Oh, watch. I'm telling you, you need to watch After the Dark. What was that movie you were trying to get me to watch last time? That's After the Dark. Okay, because I was going to look at it. This. They, t they start talking about a thought experiment, and everybody in the class draws something and tells like what their occupation.